even though it's today's world, it's still virtual, but thank you for participating. All right. Uh, uh, I'm just going to go down my list. Eric Demis. Present. Pascal Kennedy. Present. Sean Cronin is going to be a little late. Bruce Stebbins. I am here. John Robertson. Right here. Ron Hogan. I am here. And Jennifer Bonfiglio. Doesn't look like yet. Okay, and we've got Jose. Okay. Delgado is joining us. Yeah. Okay. MGM. Okay. All right, so one, two, three, four. How many, how many folks were we expecting, Mary? Uh, Kenya. Kenya has been in charge of this. Yep. Hi. So, hi. So according to my attendance list, all members are, are showing up today except for um, Mr. Cronin, who's going to be half an hour late. Um, okay. So we should have one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. Six members, um, and then and a couple other um, people who we invite. Um, one, two, three, four. Five, yeah, the licensee's representative, Jose Delgado. Right. Okay. All right. Well, what I would like to do to start off, first of all, I know we have a number of our MGC team members joining us, but we're also lucky to be uh, being joined by our chair. Um, Beth Judd Stein, and I know she probably would like to uh, welcome everybody and make a few opening remarks before we dive into the agenda. So, Kathy, if I can turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Thank you for chairing this subcommittee. I just wanted to introduce myself and to thank you for your service, the work that you do. Um, you are well aware, serves as the foundation for uh, important um, and significant monetary awards to communities across the Commonwealth to mitigate the impact of the casinos. And we're really lucky as commissioners to really benefit from the good work that you do. The process is so thorough. It's um, in, my, in my year and a half of tenure, I'm impressed continuously by the details um, that come out of your work and from our team. I wanna thank uh, particularly the leadership of Joe Delaney, Mary Thurl, and um, Tanya Perez, new to the team now. So um, just a, a hello and a, a thank you, express of gratitude on behalf of all of the commissioners. Um, we respect the care and thoughtfulness of this process so much. And I know that the communities that are the recipients of the awards are, are so appreciative. And um, in many ways, they respect so much the process because of the exact work you do. So thank you. And I'm sorry that I'm missing Sean Cronin. I, I have worked with him in the past, but it sounds like he's coming on board and wish him a hello for me. I'm gonna pop off because I'm due at another meeting, but again, just thank you so much. It's nice to see your faces, even though it's virtual. Someday soon, we'd love to meet you in person. Great, thank thank you. that. Thanks for covering us on that. Um, why don't we jump over, Todd, to the update on ethics and compliance? I know a lot of the other things further down the agenda reflect um, uh, some updates and uh, review of the 2021 uh, Community Mitigation Fund policy questions. Uh, but uh, why don't we get into some other items uh, until Mr. Cronin can join us? So, um, Todd, do you want to? step in on the update of ethics course and compliance sure i'd be happy to do that uh, if that's what uh, the group would like oh, there's someone who just joined i think that was i think derek joined us oh okay. we also have some of you dialing in remotely from four zero seven three 
I think if you hit star six, you can unmute yourself. Anybody Maybe else? John Robertson. You see some of you dialing in with the last four digits, 4073. Uh, if Tanya, I don't know who sent out the invite. If Tanya's the host of the meeting, she can unmute too. Okay. I think she may have sent out the meeting invite. Hi, this is uh, John Robertson. I'm there we go. Oh, hey, John, welcome. Made it. Thank you for your patience. It took me a while. <laughs> uh, thank you for your participation. We greatly appreciate it. So now we actually have a quorum. Um, we can we uh, move forward. I'm happy to. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we have a quorum yet, though. Oh, we don't. Because um, we only have one, two, three. There's only six members here. Oh, I thought there were seven. Let me I, well, I see Ron, Eric, Haskell, Bruce, Jennifer, and John, right? Yep. Right. John Cronin should be with us shortly. Oh, is Mr. Delgado is not. He, is, he is not a member, no. That's I not see. a member. Okay. They're just invited to, to attend. Gotcha. Okay. In that case. So, well, I know uh, a number of you could probably deliver the ethics training yourselves. Um, I'm happy to do it. I know Ron just heard it about 10 seconds ago. So um, <laughs> I, I'll turn it over to Ron in a couple of instances where he can fill in some of the blanks. But I'm happy to, to go through this. I do think it's important to talk about ethics. You can never get too much uh, ethics training, no such thing as that. Um, and I think you've all, you all uh, have actually heard me talk about these issues before. So um, for purposes of this subcommittee, we just picked out some of the highlights of the ethics laws that I'll go through. Um, and as always, please feel free to interject and ask any questions or what have you. And of course, as always as well, please feel free to reach out to me, uh, give me a call, shoot me an email or what have you after if you have any specific questions. Um, and I also would encourage you to reach out to um, counsel um, in your full-time day uh, job positions if you have specific questions about any of these materials. And further, the State Ethics Commission is always available to answer any real complicated ethics questions um, as well. And they have, as you all know by now, an attorney of the day who offers uh, free and confidential advice as to the application of the conflict of interest law um, to everyone. So I'll go ahead and, if I may, um, just share this screen so you can all see what I'm talking about. Um, and we start with everybody's status and this committee's status. And I, I take it you can all see that screen. Um, mm -hmm. As uh, a member of this body, this body itself is considered a state agency and members of the committee are considered state employees for purposes of the conflict of interest law. A municipal employee or gaming licensee representative appointed uh, to this committee is considered a special state employee as you're not full-time employees of the gaming commission, you don't get compensated as far as I'm aware, and uh, you serve uh, under a, a minimum number of hours, which makes most of you special uh, state employees. You are required to complete the online state conflict of interest law training every two years. Uh, if you're a municipal employee and you've done it in that capacity, you still have to do the state one. Um, so uh, perhaps the, you've seen the link to be able to do that, and we would just ask that uh, you ensure that you send your certificate uh, of completion over to Tanya Perez, who has uh, joined us on this call as well. She's working with uh, Joe and Mary uh, to organize the affairs of this particular subcommittee and all of our subcommittees. And there's a link right there, uh, which you won't be able to click on here, but uh, if you go on to the State Ethics Commission website, you can find the online training program. As a general matter, you'll all recall, there are essentially two kinds of conflicts of interest. There are financial conflicts, and then there are so-called appearance conflicts. The each are equally as important, uh, but they're slightly different in application. 
So the financial conflict, uh, conflicts provide that as a special state employee, you may not participate in any particular matter that may affect your financial interest or that of an immediate family member or a business organization that you're affiliated with. So the first thing to look at is the particular matter. It has to be an actual uh, item or issue that's being worked on that is uh, before this committee. It, it can't be just remote or speculative. It has to be an actual situation. Um, it can be an application. It can be a specific issue. Um, it could be a hearing. It could be a contract. Anything along those lines would be considered a particular matter. The State Ethics Commission has essentially opined that um, the review of the disbursement of community mitigation funds falls into the general category of particular matter. So to the extent which this committee will be doing, you're talking about the disbursement of such funds or how they should be dispersed and that recommendation is made to the commission or to your colleagues and other subcommittees that is generally likely to be considered a particular matter. And so if anything you're talking about here would affect the financial interest of either you personally or um, a family member, an immediate family member, or the business organization, it could be either the city or town or your employer, um, then you may be in conflict of interest law territory and should review the situation before you proceed uh, with any uh, issue that you're discussing here as part of this subcommittee. So those are financial conflicts of interest. The second kind are generally referred to as appearance conflicts. Um, and the word appearance, of course, doesn't actually appear in the state conflict of interest law, but that's what it's known as. And that rule uh, provides that you may not act in any manner that a reasonable person might conclude would cause you to act with bias in your job. Um, the principle being that the uh, citizens are entitled to expect of all of us and you as special state employees that you will perform your duties here um, in an unbiased uh, and even manner, regardless of any personal interests or outside influences that you may have uh, in your life. And to the extent there's something that may cause someone from the outside looking in to think that you might not be able to do that, even if it's not true, you're required to disclose uh, that particular issue to your appointing authority. In the case of this committee, uh, your appointing authority depends on uh, who you are employed by or the entity that uh, sent you here, and then you're required to disclose that uh, to those uh, folks. I'd also suggest if you do find yourself in that position, you just let us know as well uh, so we can help you navigate uh, through those situations. So those are the two types of conflicts, your financial and your appearances. A couple of other areas just to touch on really quickly are the gifts provisions of the uh, com uh, conflict of interest law. As I'm sure you're aware, the conflict of interest law provides that you may not accept gifts or and gratuities of substantial value which are given for or because of official acts performed or to be performed uh, because of your official position. The State Ethics Commission has defined substantial value to be $50 or more. Um, as you may know, the Gaming Commission has adopted an enhanced code of ethics that applies to all of its employees. Um, it does not apply to subcommittee members, but it applies to all of the Gaming Commission employees. And in there, the gift provisions uh, prevent or prohibit acceptance of any gifts regardless of their value. Um, and the commission is of the general position that that's the better approach for us. And so the message is just to be very careful if you find yourself in a position uh, where someone has offered you a gift of any value. Because, and that weaves into the second piece, which is the unwarranted privilege. You're not allowed to use or attempt your official, uh, use your official position to secure for yourself or others unwarranted privileges or exemptions which are not available to members of the general public. So a, an example of that would be the acceptance of a gift. If someone is offering you something, even if it's worth less than $50, and they're giving it to you because of work you have done for them or that you didn't, or an action you didn't take, 
that could be, in addition to the gift uh, provisions, be considered an unwarranted privilege. So you need to be very careful about accepting anything like that. Um, you also need to be careful of attempting to use the position uh, to gain favor or carry some advantage for yourself or others that other members of the public wouldn't. Uh, for example, calling up Mary and saying, hey, Mary, you know, an application came in late. Uh, would you mind just looking at it for my friend anyway, because he's really sorry. That is um, something that would likely be considered an unwarranted privilege because a, a general member of the public couldn't really uh, make such a request with the same type of influence that you might be able to because you serve on this committee. So you just need to be very careful about using your position here uh, to any kind of private advantage. The most complicated part of the state conflict of interest law that applies to subcommittee members is this section uh, four, which is referred to as the divided loyalty section. And there are essentially two pieces to it. Uh, it's section A and C of section four. The first, as you'll see, and I, I won't read it uh, verbatim, but essentially says that you can't uh, directly or indirectly receive or request compensation from anyone other than the Commonwealth or a state agency in relation to a particular matter in which the Commonwealth or state agency is a party or has a direct and substantial interest, which means in the context of these community mitigation uh, fund discussions, assuming that the disbursement of such funds is a particular matter, that you can't be paid by a municipality or a private interest or anyone other than the Commonwealth um, to handle any such matter. So in the context of your municipal work or your private work, you can't work on community mitigation fund applications if that's part of your job or offer advice or, or things like that along those lines. That could run afoul of this divided loyalties provision. And the second part is similar, but it says that you can't, other than in the discharge of your duties here, act as an agent or attorney for anyone other than the Commonwealth in, in, uh, in connection with a particular matter. Uh, that this agency has a direct and substantial interest. So the commission and the state have a direct and substantial interest in the disbursement of community mitigation funds and how those funds are distributed. So you can't act as uh, an attorney if you're an attorney or an agent uh, for your city or town or for your private business interest um, in relation to the disbursement of community mitigation funds. So that most commonly could apply in the context of filling out an application uh, that will be submitted to the commission for uh, an award of funds um, or for calling or appearing before the commission once an application has been submitted to explain the city or town's position as to why it's deserving of funds. You can't do things like that because that would be considered acting as an agent for the community or the entity um, in a matter that the gaming commission has an interest. So that is essentially considered sitting on both sides of the table, and you are not allowed to do that under the conflict of interest law. This is very complicated though, so if any of these issues arise, and if you're concerned that you may find yourself in this situation, I uh, definitely uh, suggest you give me a call, or uh, your uh, counsel, or the State Ethics Commission, and again, we can help you navigate your way through this. In practical terms, the Ethics Commission has spelled it out for us in this fashion. They've said that if you're a paid municipal employee, you may not do any paid work for the municipality relating to matters that are before the uh, subcommittees. You may do, if you're an unpaid municipal employee, you may do unpaid work for your municipality relating to municipal, to uh, subcommittee matters, however. So if you are an uncompensated board member, you can actually uh, do some work on community mitigation related matters because you're not receiving compensation from someone other than the, comp the Commonwealth for that work. Thirdly though, whether you're paid or unpaid, you can't act as an agent uh, for that municipality, meaning you can't communicate with the commission on behalf of the municipality with the particular subcommittee or with the staff in relation to community mitigation funds or the disbursement of such funds. And you can't act as an attorney in relation to those matters for 
either your private business enterprise or for your, uh, your community. They have advised though that a municipal employee whose responsibilities in their full-time positions don't relate to the impact of gaming on the community or are unlikely actually to face any issues under section four by serving on this particular committee. So if you don't find yourself in that position, you probably don't have a lot to be concerned about. A few examples, uh, and I, this is uh, the next to last slide here. Just really quickly, a subcommittee member may not work as a paid municipal employee to prepare an application that is requesting funds for work uh, or work on uh, municipal activities that are actually funded by an award from the Community Mitigation Fund. You would be considered either receiving compensation or acting as an agent um, in that particular context. Um, a committee member may work as an unpaid municipal employee to prepare an application uh, or uh, on activities funded by an award, but you can't sign the application and you can't communicate, it, that meaning you can't serve as an agent on behalf of the municipality with the subcommittee or with uh, any other state agencies about the work of this subcommittee. A subcommittee member may not offer legal advice to a municipality in relation to any application or award, whether you're paid or unpaid. And finally, there's uh, section 17 of the Conflict of Interest Law, Chapter 268A, essentially provides that subcommittee, uh, subcommittee members can't act as an agent of the subcommittee in communicating with the municipality um, either. But there are exceptions in the law uh, relative to municipal employees if the municipality designates you as a special municipal employee. So that's something to consider if you find yourself in that particular uh, area. And again, just to reiterate, um, the aim of this presentation is not to make anyone an expert in the conflict of interest laws, but really just to give you some background in the types of things that this conflict of interest law covers and the types of pitfalls uh, that people uh, may face them with, uh, ears, uh, face themselves uh, with. So again, I I'd, uh, recommend or and offer and invite you to uh, give me a call or any member of the legal staff uh, if you have any questions um, or even give the State Ethics Commission a call. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Um, otherwise, um, uh, best wishes and uh, we'll be in touch. Are there any for questions for Todd? I know a number of you have been through this already, but certainly open the floor if anybody has any particular questions for Todd while we have it. Okay. All right, Todd, thanks very much for your help. Um, I'm going to move around a little bit on the agenda, and uh, I know Mr. Cronin is hopefully going to be joining us shortly. Uh, but uh, if we can move down, Joe, to item number six, which is the update on the 2020 awards before we start jumping into some of the new business. Do you want to go ahead and, uh, and give everybody an overall update on the, the 2020 awards and the 2020 award process that we just went through? Sure. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so uh, 2020 proved to be pretty challenging for us with uh, the COVID-19 and all. Um, so, you know, when we got our applications at the beginning of February um, and started reviewing them, obviously the middle of March, things uh, shut down and we started to having to work remotely. We had to do all of our meetings with our applicants remotely. And, um, and we also had to rethink some of the assumptions that we made when the guidelines were developed um, on, you know, into the effects of COVID-19 and what that would have, the effect would have on our applications. So, um, you know, the, um, just go, going into the, the basic numbers, um, if you recall our target for last year was $11.5 million in grants. We had $6 million for the East, $5 million for the West and $500,000 for the Category 2 facility, the uh, Plainridge Park, in the area of Plainridge Park. 
Uh, what ended up happening there was that in total, we only awarded about $6.7 million in grants with about 3.9 million going to region A, 2.5 million going to region B, and 283,000 going towards uh, the tribal and category two facilities. Um, so there are, there are a bunch of reasons why that number came in low. Partly it was due to COVID. So for example, in our workforce grants, we had uh, two workforce grants um, that totaled, their application originally were $800,000. Uh, but as we got into it, what we found, especially with COVID, that a lot of this work was being done in the area of culinary and hospitality, where essentially all those folks had been laid off at the casinos and, and also in the broader community. Um, there, were, there were, you know, a huge number of layoffs in the restaurant business, hotel business, and things of that nature. So what we ended up doing is, you know, if these grants have to be the result of an impact from the casino. And if, if the, you know, our licensees were sort of indicating to us that certainly for at least this year, they, they didn't see those jobs coming back as strongly as, uh, you know, as, as we had hoped. And that resulted in us, um, needing to you know not give out grants for those for that kind of work so you know in those workforce grants we wound up um giving them the grants for the work for the uh uh, uh basic uh, adult educate adult basic education you know um high school diplomas and so on uh which all casino employees require so those, those dollar values were significantly reduced. And in addition to that, there were a couple of areas like the, the first year of our, uh, our construction project grants, we received, we uh, targeted $3 million statewide for that. And we received applications of about $6.7 million. So in that case, we ended up having to sort of trying to keep with that guideline, we had to eliminate some of those projects. And also we did have a number of projects that just came in that didn't really meet our standards, where they had to demonstrate a connection to the casino. So in the end, uh, you know, we decided that you know, with COVID and all that we would be uh, pretty uh, conservative on how we, were, how we were putting out money. And uh, so that's basically, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. That's basically why we went from that sort of eleven and a half million down to the uh, six point seven million. Now, if you recall the way that we uh, divvied up the money, we did it by region, and the money in each region that wasn't spent will roll over into two thousand twenty-one. So we will have that money available for twenty twenty-one plus the new money that is generated as part of the. Um, you know, just from our general uh, uh, gaming revenues. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, that's a, essentially a little summary of where we are. Um, you know, we got some really good projects for this year. We got a bunch of those uh, new construction projects, which was great. We continued doing transportation planning and non-transportation planning and, you know, our specific impacts. So um, we think we got a lot of good projects, but also we had, you know, quite a, quite a number of challenges to overcome. And I guess with that, I'll, I'll open that up to any questions that anybody might have. Anybody have any questions on the, the kind of 2020 awards that were made? All right, um, seeing none, um, I'll just check in here and see if Mr. Cronin has joined us. I don't believe he Yes, I, I just, I can't get it online, so I dialed in. Uh, thank you, Sean. Greatly appreciate it. Happy to have you join us by phone. Thank you so much for uh, for dialing in. It uh, gives us the opportunity to to uh, have a quorum and obviously have some good discussion on some of the policy issues, which I know are on the agenda. Uh, I am going to hold off. Um, uh, Sean, you missed uh, our our 
chair happen to join us real quickly and, and give some welcoming and thank yous. Uh, we're also joined on this call by uh, our executive director, Karen Wells, our new executive director, Karen Wells, as well as our new general counsel, um, Todd Grossman, and a new member of the Community Mitigation Fund team, uh, Tanya Perez, who's come on board uh, with us to assist Mary and Joe, uh, obviously, as we all recognize the the program is getting a little bit bigger. We have a number of grants that uh, not only we awarded this year, but in previous years that we continue to track. Uh, so we certainly help, uh, we certainly thought that some uh, extra bodies on the team to uh, help us uh, make sure that the grants continue to be in compliance and being spent uh, effectively and according to our guidelines was helpful. Um, I'll come back to the approval of the minutes in just a second, but um, uh, Sean, we also did a, a quick update on ethics course and compliance. Certainly, uh, we won't go back over that. Uh, you're certainly familiar with them because we've gone through the uh, uh, an overview of those before, but obviously if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to, uh, Todd, to Todd Grossman and, and uh, the MGC legal team if you have any questions. Um, okay. Joe, can we move on to a uh, discussion around the 2021 mitigation fund policy questions? Sure. Let me, I'm going to share my screen. I think this was all sent out. This was sent out to all of you as well, but um, just so we have it up on the screen. <clears throat> so, you know, for this year, again, due to the challenges that we had last year and, um, you know, the fact that we went uh, almost four months, I think, without revenues from our licensees. We've really, we're really not recommending a whole lot of wholesale changes to the program for this year. Um, we're, we're saying let's sort of keep status quo, but a few things did arise during the course of this last year that um, we uh, put in some questions regarding that that would like everybody to think about. Now you'll see in this in this document, a lot of these questions are questions that we ask every year, and I'm not gonna dwell on these for very long because I think some of them are almost, uh, they really answer themselves. Um, I will try to focus mostly on those new items that um, that have come up uh, in, in the, the last year during our, our review of applications and so on. But I will walk through each of these items quickly. So the first question is, should the commission place an overall limit on grants for 2021? Well, we've always placed a limit on grants and, and we certainly uh, are fiscally constrained by how much money we have. So I think you know, the answer to that is, um, you know, we have to put some kind of a limit on, on the grants. And then should the commission continue to place a per grant limit for 2021 20, CMF awards? Again, we've always limited the uh, amount of grants to sort of a maximum, um, just so we're not getting these really crazy requests uh, initially. Um, you can see here what all of those numbers are um, and, and where, where we're falling out with them. And I think maybe with the exception of the transportation construction projects, um, I think we want to keep them the same as they are. And I'll talk about transportation construction a little bit later. Um, should the commission continue to place a limit on grants in each gaming region based on the projected tax revenues generated uh, for the CMF by the facility in that region? You know, as we've done the last couple of years, we've split up uh, the funds by region, by the, by the dollars generated within that region. Um, and while, this year, and as I just said, so we had some money that we didn't spend from last year, so that will roll over into this year in accordance with our guidelines. And then there's the, then there's the dollars that are generated during calendar year 2020. So right now we're still uh, doing kind of a guesstimate for um, the October, November, December revenues uh, and September revenues. We haven't seen those yet. Um, but my early estimate shows that we will, we will have about $8 million available for Region A and $5 million available for Region B. And then for Category 2, um, we're again proposing a sort of a $500,000 cap for those impacts in that area. Typically in the past, we haven't seen that kind of uh, 
activity down with the category two facility, but we do certainly want to keep a certain amount set aside for that. Um, and then this is kind of, this is the 2020 results. This is directly out of our guidelines from last year and explains exactly how we, uh, we split up the money and how it rolls over for, you know, the, the money will roll over for a period of three years within each region. And if it's, in, if it's not used in that region, then it will sort of roll, it would roll over into a fund that could be used by either region. Um, and we're not proposing any changes to that. Um, number four, this, uh, this reflects back, this is one of the new items that we really want you to think about. Um, they're talking about this is the workforce grants and uh, should we continue to be uh, doing those in the uh, east and west areas? And if so, at what level? And then also, should the scope of these grants be limited due to the effects of COVID-19 on the hospitality industry? You know, I think, um, again, the, the issuance of these grants has to be in response to an impact of the casinos. And the way that we sort of got at hospitality and culinary was saying that the need was so big between MGM and Encore that uh, they were taking, not only were they hiring a lot of people, but they were taking a lot of people from other restaurants and other hotels and things of that nature to come to work at that facility. And they're providing grants to help people train in those areas is um, made a whole lot of sense and, and fell within sort of the purview of, of the community mitigation fund grants. But I think, um, you know, what we're saying is that under, with COVID-19, it has had a dramatic effect on the food and beverage and hotel industries. I mean, you'll see now a bunch of hotels are being used by colleges, uh, you know, for dorm rooms instead of, instead of hotels. Uh, I heard a report that maybe a third of the restaurants in Massachusetts have closed and might never open again. So uh, the notion that we need to be training hospitality and um, culinary workers is um, certainly somewhat questionable. So I guess I would ask all of you to think about that and whether or not we should be uh, doing that and or in, in where we should be focusing grants in relation to cas casino impacts. Um, number five, should we continue to allow funding, pay a portion of construction costs of transportation projects? So last year was our first year of transportation projects. Um, and it was very successful, I think. Uh, we established a $3 million statewide target. Um, we received over $6 million in applications. And we funded actually more than our $3 million target. We funded $3.2 million because we wanted to make sure that we got at um, all of the really good applications. Um, so I think, you know, we, I think we certainly want to continue this program. It shows that there's a certain need there. Um, and uh, the question is, do we want to um, do we want to do anything with the statewide target or with the dollar value target? Um, my th initial thoughts on this are maybe the statewide target could go up a little bit since we have more money in the east. Particularly, we, you know, last year we programmed six million, and we're suggesting there's probably about eight million available for the east. And you know, these transportation construction projects are pretty expensive. Um, in 2020, we did get one application for more than a million dollars. It was for a million and a half, and we did end up awarding it because it was really only a, a fairly small percentage of the project, and it was a really well-conceived and funded project um, where we only wound up funding, I think, something less than 20% of the total project cost, um, even at a million and a half dollars. So um, we would really like you to think about that on those targets. Um, and item six, this one came up again during the, uh, with the transportation construction projects. Should we cap the construction costs that the community mitigation fund will, will fund? So 
the way the guidelines were written last year, it said the commission anticipates that any CMF assistance will only be for a percentage of the cost and any such of any such project and that significant other federal, state, local, private, or other funding will be available to pay for the costs of any such project. I think last year I had mentioned the possibility of putting a hard cap on that, um, on the percent that the community mitigation fund would provide, and it was decided to not do that at that time. And what we found is that as the projects came in, they sort of ran the gamut. We had uh, two projects come in that proposed 0% match, local match, that it was 100% gaming commission funds. Um, and then we had everything in between. Um, so, you know, we had a difficult time, you know, all of these projects, there's certainly a local benefit in addition to addressing the casino impact. Um, and on a lot of these, I think the argument could be made and, and should be made that the local uh, benefit is well in excess of the mitigation of the casino impact. Um, so what we ended up doing is we didn't fund the two projects that had a 0% uh, local match. In fact, these, those two projects were actually pretty far afield from the casino and you know, they didn't really make a great demonstration that, that these projects were really uh, um, addressing a particular impact of the casino. So we had more than just uh, the issue of 0% local funding. Um, so what we wound up with is the maximum funding that we provided was about one third of the project cost. And even that was sort of, we were a little bit on the fence on whether that was maybe too high for the, for the, for the benefit um, of addressing the casino impact. So that's one of the questions that we really have is should we put an, uh, a maximum on that? Should it be maybe 25% or 33% or something of that nature? Hey Joe, can we just check in with everybody? Is there anybody who has any comments or questions about the the six guideline questions that Joe's reviewed so far? Any thoughts or comments? Hi, Commissioner. This is uh, Jose Delgado. I'm not one of your uh, team members of this committee, but I did have a question in in response to. Um, particularly something like the transportation funds, is it the understanding that when the commission grants these awards, is it is it 100% the understanding that these grants are being given out because there is an impact or, because I, I know Joe kind of went over it really quickly and so that was one of the things I'm curious about just on my end, um, because when we when we write support letters, we obviously want these funds uh, to stay in Western Mass, that was one of the original reasons that the, the committees have fought for these funds to stay in Western Mass so they don't get consumed by the eastern part of the state and that they don't go end up in the general fund. I guess I just would like some clarification on it. If these grants are granted, is it 100% that there is an impact? Yeah, you know, Jose, the like, just let's use an example of the you know, we, we issued a grant to West Springfield for a million dollars to do some complete streets work that they did. Now we yep. gave them a grant before that to do a transportation uh, study. And, you know, they have to demonstrate that there's a casino impact associated with that. Now we fully understand that, you know, when you do a project like this, uh, like a complete streets project, it's, it's affecting more than just the impact of the casino. Now, what they demonstrated was that it was just through the initially through the um, the environmental impact report process, um, and this was on. Oh, I'm forgetting the it's, it's um, Park Street. When, when you come over the north the north end bridge, is it? Um, yeah. Yeah, into West Springfield. You know, the the EIR was showing that about five percent of the traffic would go that way from the casino. And during peak hours, you're saying, okay, so that there, there's a real impact on those streets. But the other thing is this this complete streets thing is improving pedestrian access and vehicular access to the people of West Springfield, not just to the casino. So this was one of the projects, I think it was about a third of the project cost is coming from the community mitigation fund with two thirds coming from other sources, the community or the state. 
Um, so, you know, yes, they have to demonstrate an impact of the casino, but in the case of these transportation projects, we're saying that that ancillary benefit to the community is probably more than just addressing the casino impact. Got it. Okay, Th thanks for clarifying that. Okay. Anyone else before we move down into some of the additional questions? Okay, hearing none, Joe, you want to keep going? Number okay. seven. Yeah, number seven, this is sort of a repeat from last year. Um, we had talked about trying to look at what some of the larger multi-year projects might be in, in the areas. And then, you know, COVID hit and, um, you know, frankly, we didn't really uh, get around to doing that uh, this year. Um, we may try to look at that again uh, for next year. Um, and number eight, this is, this is brand new. Um, so should the commission consider the creation of an emergency reserve within the community mitigation fund for unknown impacts that arise after February 1st, 2021? So in the past, we have at least in, certainly internally, and I'm, I can't remember if we have discussed it with this group or the uh, local community mitigation advisory committees uh, otherwise, but there was a talk of, you know, what happens, we have this February 1st deadline for applications. What happens if something, you know, an impact is discovered or happens, newly begins after that date? That would sort of leave people completely out in the lurch for maybe a year or more while sort of waiting to file an application. So the notion here was if, if we could put a reserve of a fairly nominal amount of money, and I'm throwing out the number of $200,000 here as being um, you know, substantial enough to help address an impact, but not so substantial as it would really affect the capacity of the, the mitigation fund. And the idea here is that in a previous program that I worked in, we had an emergency reserve. I used to work with um, a program we, where we funded water and sewer projects for cities and towns. And we had an emergency reserve. And, you know, if something really catastrophic happened that had a huge public health impact, um, they could come to us and and get money immediately rather than having to go through a sort of a whole whole long uh, process. So I think here, you know, we're saying that I think I think we'd like to do something like this. You know, it truly has to be something that was not that didn't exist before that February first deadline. It truly has to be something new. It can't just be something like, oh, I missed the deadline. I want to throw in an application and try to get the money. It has to be a truly a new impact, and it has to be directly related to the casino. Again, this can't be uh, something that um, uh, you know that has an ancillary uh, connection to the casino. But it certainly has to be something that's it's sort of brand new that nobody knew that it that it was happening, or was at least first discovered after that. Um, and I think the notion of this. You know, this isn't to be used for like cost overruns on a project or anything of that nature. It has to be truly a new impact. And, you know, the idea here is that it would allow us, um, you know, to be more nimble in, in trying to help the communities. Now, I can't say even, I, I, I don't have any idea what this, what kind of a, a, an emergency could arise. But then again, I didn't really have any idea that a pandemic was going to arise either. So, uh, you know, and, and we're certainly not here to mitigate COVID impacts, but, um, you know, you, you just never know what could arise. And I think the likelihood of, of a fund like this being used is probably pretty small, but having it there in sort of a nominal sum, it seems like it's, it's prudent to do that. And, you know, we're working around the, the issues of, you know, our, our, statute says applications have to be in before February 1st. Well, how do you deal with that uh, from a legal standpoint? And we have Todd who's working on that with his staff um, to try to figure that out. But I guess the question for this group is, do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it's something we should try to do? Or do you think it's something that's just harebrained and we want to throw aside? Are there anybody's, welcome anybody's thoughts? Obviously, as Joe pointed out, this is somewhat of a um, a, a 
a new guideline, something that we've been thinking about, but something that would certainly uh, uh, be different than the makeup for the use of the community mitigation fund in the past. Is there anybody out there that's got any thoughts or ideas or suggestions as to how we might proceed? Joe, have you had any um, experience over the past few years where anybody has reached out to you after the deadline and come up with anything um, that was, you know, unforeseen? No, not really. You know, I, I guess, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, you know, the Everett Police Department, um, you know, they, they came to us initially saying, hey, we've got these, um, you know, the, with uh, late night drink service, the 2 to 4 a.m. service that wasn't anticipated. Um, and they were wondering if they could get money for that. And, you know, we told them, yeah, you probably can. I mean, it's an eligible cost. Public safety costs are eligible. But you'd have to wait until the regular process, and they did follow the regular process. So it wasn't, you know, I, I guess you that that you could possibly consider an emergency, but it, I guess yeah. it really wasn't an emergency per but se. I mean, it's unexpected, so I guess that makes sense. Um, but no, not really. I mean, obviously, many people have called me up asking, "How do I get this money?" And they've called me up in March, and I say, "Well, you got to wait till next year." Uh, but they weren't truly looking at. Um, emergency type thing. So again, I think the likelihood of this fund being used is probably pretty small, but I, 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 I do like the notion of it being there. Um, now, in the program that I used to run, I mean, obviously, underground infrastructure is more prone to catastrophic uh, failures. Um, I'll just give you an example. In the town of Plymouth, the main trunk line of their sewer that brings all of their wastewater to their wastewater treatment plant uh, first. And they needed money fast. And we were able to get them that money quickly and not have them have to wait until, you know, again, we had a program that was annual in basis. And, you know, it would have taken them sort of like a year and a half to get the money and we get them the money in three or four months. So it cut down on the process. Now, do I have anything in my back pocket that I think could happen here? I really don't. Um, and again, I think the likelihood is pretty small, but. But I don't think it's a bad idea, especially because it's a small amount that you're talking about, you know, in the event that something does arise. Yeah, and you know, and on, on the amount of money too, by, by sort of ear, putting aside a small amount of money, the commission under all of their categories can increase that amount. And, and they would be, you know, if, if somebody came in, I don't know, and needed half a million dollars to address an, unknown impact, um, the commission could waive that $200,000 requirement and go up to 500, assuming there's money available in the fund to do so. Um, you know, in fact, every category is always waivable by the commission. But again, I think just putting that aside, and look, if it doesn't get used in a year, it would just expire, and we'd re-up it next, the next year if we decided that we wanted to do that. And it, and it just, you know, really wouldn't have much of an impact on the, on the fund. I guess that was my other question was, would that roll over like the rest of the funds or would that expire and it would just be the flat rate each year? Yeah, it would expire. The example that we use is, and if we have um, money that we've earmarked for the Region C, for the, for the, for the I should say for the tribal facility, that for um, we, every year for the last three, I think we put, put aside $200,000 for the uh, SERPED, the Southeast Region Planning Authority, um, to help out those communities around Taunton uh, should the casino move ahead. And every year it's been, oh, nothing's happening on the casino, so that money just goes away and we re-up it the next year and we re-up it the next year. And we did the same thing this year. So I look at it as being very similar to that. We would just put this money up. It wouldn't be earmarked. In that money, obviously, is earmarked to an agency. This wouldn't be earmarked to anyone in particular. It would be available to anyone, you know, should a, a true emergency arise. Thanks, Jennifer, for your thoughts. Anyone else? I mean, we're, I think the other issue hanging in the back of our mind is, you know, 2020 is probably going to wreak some havoc on some local and municipal budgets. Um, Again, it's an expectation, but uh, another reason for us to have this conversation around 
some type of uh, emergency set aside. Eric, did you want to weigh in? I, I did, Mr. Chair. Uh, I actually support this. Um, I think it's a, it's a great idea. It's a great start in laying foundation. If the past six, eight months haven't, hasn't proven any to, uh, anything to us, it's certainly proven that there are a lot of unknown unknowns. Um, and I think this would provide some reasonable flexibility uh, and guidance, um, knowing that we cannot control our future. And we should always have uh, policies in place that would make it easier for us um, to adapt uh, to situations outside of our control. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? All right, appreciate everybody's input. Joe, you wanna keep going with um, what yeah. we number nine or number eight? Uh, where was it? So that was, um, oh yeah, so number nine, um, public safety operational costs. Um, we allowed those for the first time in 2020. And um, I think we're proposing not to make really any changes to that. We had a maximum of $200,000 um, just by way of last year. We did have four applications for public safety operational funding. Um, we approved two. Uh, we approved one with a reduced level of funding and one of them was denied. The one that was denied um, was was actually out in Springfield with the fire department where it was quite clear that these costs uh, should have been covered under their with their host community agreement. Um, so we so we did not uh, approve that application. Um, on number ten, how should we use the information from the annual look back studies in, in determining mitigation requests? So just in this past year, you know we we've, we've got. Um, some traffic studies that are being done by the licensees and some look back studies of various sorts as well as our own research agenda and wherever that information is available we are utilizing it um, we did run into some difficulty last year out in the, in the western part of the state where some of the look back studies uh, for the first year had not been completed partially due to covid and other reasons and it would have been really valuable information to have in making an assessment on a couple of the applications. But so we had to um, uh, do that, uh, I won't say blind, but, uh, but uh, maybe with one hand tied behind our back. Um, Region C, in fact, I just mentioned this about the money that we've been putting aside uh, for the tribal casino. Uh, we don't really expect anything to be happening within Region C, at least uh, during the point where we're getting applications. Uh, Bruce, do we have any update from the, the commission at all on, I know we went out and asked for um, comment on Region C. Any, is there any idea of when we're going to consider that? We went out uh, before COVID hit and put out a, a request for uh, expressions of interest. Uh, to a number of questions that we have around the prospects for Region C and whether the market could bear another uh, Category 1 casino at this point. Uh, we did get some responses to that uh, request for expressions of interest. Unfortunately, uh, we got them right back um, right, around the time, right around the time that everything had shut down because of COVID. So right now, uh, that's just um, hanging out there right now. Okay, um, so item 12, should the commission require a dollar for dollar match for its CMF grants? Um, we have not required dollar for dollar matches uh, on our grants. We do ask folks to provide in-kind services things of that nature. You know, under the non-transportation and transportation planning grants, we, we do allow personnel costs to be included. For instance, if under a transportation planning grant, if you were doing a, um, you know, a large study, uh, sometimes they want to hire either a consultant or actual municipal employee to work on that effort. Um, Last year, we changed our rule saying the Community Mitigation Fund will not pay the full cost of any municipal employee. And we did have some requests for that where 
uh, where community said, well, we'll, we want you to pay for the whole salary and we'll pay, we'll pay for the benefits and so on. And similar to the transportation construction projects that the review team was having a little tough time with some of these applications where, again, there was an impact of the casino being addressed, but it was really a large community benefit that was also associated with it. And when someone was proposing like, you know, personnel to work 100% on this, you know, the community has to certify that 100% of their time is spent on casino related projects and so on. You know, so we've had some sort of internal discussion saying, hey, if we require a match on these things, we may get some more, um, thoughtful applications uh, on some of these things. And that also, you know, saying, hey, if they're providing a good match, saying, you know, we know there's a local benefit and we know then part of it's casino related and that, you know, that's a little better distribution. Of course, if you require a match, um, there will probably be a reduced level of applications. The more, the more money you require communities to put up, the less likely they are to apply for the funds. And we certainly want our funds to be uh, well utilized. So I don't think we really have a recommendation there. I guess just would like you to think about that. And, and if you have ideas on, on that, we'd, be, we'd like to hear them. Um, okay, now this here, should the commission place a time limit for the use of previously authorized reserves for the 2021 Community Mitigation Fund program. So back in 2015 and 16, we gave all of the surrounding communities a $100,000 grant. Um, really, the old notion was to prepare for the openings of the casinos. Um, but we have a number of these communities who have not used this money yet, and it's and it, you know it's tying up some capacity in the program. Um, and you know, frankly, we can't just have money sitting out there forever. Uh, so I think the thought here was, is that we probably should uh, put the communities on notice that they have some sort of time certain to, to spend this money or lose it. Um, you know, my thought is that if we gave them till the end of 2021, calendar year 2021, you know, to at least get the money programmed for a study or something. Um, so that would still give them plenty of time to be thinking about this. Uh, we do need to reach out to all these communities. There could very well be some communities that have no idea that they have these funds available. Uh, you know, you have turnover, you have, you know, many of these communities, you know, the, the town planner turns over, the, um, uh, you know, the, there's, a new, there's a new mayor, there's, you know, a whole new administration. Um, so there are communities that may very well not even know that they have this money. So our our plan is this fall is you know to be reaching out to all of the communities um just to meet with them and go over the grants that they have and and the, and the reserves that they have available that kind of thing but i guess you know we would ask you to think about whether or not or, or what a good time frame might be to give them you know to, to get that those grant funds you utilized is there is are there any particular comments or questions about that question? Obviously, it's a somewhat change in our in our program, but I didn't know if there was any direct feedback that any of you might have on that. I think it's a it makes a lot of sense. It's a good approach. I think most most grants people receive their timeline timelines associated with it, and I think you made a good point that there's a lot of turnover um, between elected officials and municipal staff, and some may not know that they haven't expended the funds. So I think first reaching out to them makes a lot of sense, and then following up maybe with a with a deadline to use them. Okay. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, um, should the commission continue authorized funding for non-transportation related planning um, for those communities that have expended their reserves? Um, we have had some really good um, non-transportation planning projects, um, and I think we're not really proposing any change in this area. I think uh, the, the limit seems to be fine, and um, you know we're getting some good applications. This year we did get some not so good applications in this category, um, where uh, the 
connection to the casino, casino I will say charitably was tenuous. <laughs> um, you know, some of these seemed like community saying, yeah, well, let's give it a shot. If we get it, great. If we don't, uh, you know, no harm, no foul, I think. Um, so we did have to deny, I think, I think there were at least three of these applications that we denied um, this year due to that fact where there really was not a good connection to the casino. Um, yeah, real quick. Oh, sure. Um, in the last advisory committee meeting we were at, there was some mention about um, provide, providing workshops for um, the surrounding communities. Is that something that's being considered? Because, I mean, it, it seems foolish for these communities to, I think they're just throwing a dart at a dartboard and hoping maybe it'll stick, but I think a workshop would be good so that they understand there has to be a nexus between their application and an actual impact. <laughs> it may yeah, save what, you some re, you know, reviewing unnecessary applications. Yeah, what I'm planning on doing is um, probably in early January, get, get the holidays out of the way, maybe you know, that first or second week of January, a couple weeks, two or three weeks before applications are due. Um, have and you know the fact now that we can do this stuff remotely actually makes it I think a whole lot easier I mean before it would have meant you know doing you know setting up a location and a meeting in the east and the west and and down by the category two and you know with this this way I can set up a couple of different times for workshops and you know and do it remotely and and explain you know what's a good connection to the casino and what's not a good connection to the casino and you know how uh, you know sort of how our thought process works on some of these things i mean that that connection to the casino was the single most difficult question to answer in all of these applications i mean we see these applications and most of them you know a few of them are pretty out there but most of them are are, are really right on the money and we really like them um but there's no connection to the casino. And if there isn't, we simply can't give the money out. You know, we look at these things going, hey, that's a great project, but sorry, it just doesn't meet the guidelines. So, so yeah, that's on my plans for early January is to get notifications. You know, our, our guidelines will come out at the beginning of December and we'll be notifying, you know, half the world to that, that they're out there and, and letting them know. And I, I think at that point, um, in that announcement that we make, I'll want to at the same time make an announcement of, of when the workshops will be. Um, okay. Oh, administrative costs. Right now we don't allow administrative costs uh, in community mitigation fund applications, except with the workforce. Um, due to that na the nature of that program, they are eligible. We're not really proposing any changes to that. Uh, private parties. We've had, um, we sort of tightened up those guidelines last year on who's eligible for funding. Um, and we're not proposing any changes to that. Uh, joint applications, we, uh, we have always, always encouraged them. We actually have an incentive for communities to work together. I think this is one of the things I wanna stress in the workshops is that some of these things, you know, we've had communities, individual communities come in you know, looking for say money to do like a tourist plan. And wouldn't it be great if three or four communities got together and did a more regional kind of tourist plan than each community sort of trying to do their own. Um, and then number 18, should communities be limited to only one specific impact grant? Um, we're not really proposing any changes to that. Um, this, this one, number 19, um, Back in 2016, the commission gave the Hamden County Sheriff's Office um, a grant for $2 million. Their, their uh, Western Mass Correctional Alcohol Center was located in the footprint of MGM, and they needed to move. And they, of course, they went to a new facility, um, and their, their uh, cost of lease assistance went uh, way up. So we agreed to fund five years at $400,000 per year, or a total of $2 million. And last year, of course, was the last year of that. And um, they have asked us to consider extending this lease assistance. Um, 
you know, as, as an entity, they're eligible to apply for a grant, regardless of whether we, I mean, I suppose if the commission said specifically, we're not going to give them any more money, it would be, you know, somewhat a waste of time for them to apply. But as, I mean, they're an eligible entity, so they can apply for the money, but, and, you know, out in the Western region, so far, we've had more money available than we've had for applications. Uh, not that that's necessarily a consideration, but um, you know that that's sort of where it is, um, and we're just putting it out there as to whether or not we should consider extending that. Um, number twenty. This is. Um, we have some older grants that have not expended their money. Uh, we've got three or four or five of them where we're, they were given a grant and they've just, and the communities have just never moved ahead with it. And similar to the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the $100,000 uh, monies that we gave to all the communities, you know, this, this money either needs to be spent or we need to rescind it. And again, I think we want to reach out to all these communities and say, hey, do you really have plans to spend this money or not? Um, you know, there's maybe some possibilities of repurposing it if it's, you know, pretty closely associated with what they wanted to do with it. But we have a couple of grants that we gave, you know, like to Everett and Somerville uh, to design a head house, the head house that connects into the Sullivan, uh, the um, Assembly Square station head house when it looks like, you know, Encore is not going to be building the bridge right now. So we obviously don't want to be spending money on something that's not going to happen. Um, so I think that's just another thing um, to opine on whether or not we should be taking that money back or giving them a time frame to use it. And this, this um, number 21, this year we had a community apply in two different categories of grant for the same project which we never really envisioned that happening. Um, but there was nothing in the guidelines that prohibited it from happening. Um, and in fact, we actually did end up awarding both of those grants. Those were sort of the city of Chelsea on the Williams and Beecham Street corridor. Um, you know, they could have asked for a waiver on one of the categories or put it all in there. But it was a really good project and we really did it. But I think we didn't envision people coming in on two categories. Um, and I think we would like to sort of tighten that up and, and say, look, apply, you can apply to one category. And if your project is worthwhile and you want to go over the dollar values, make your argument and we can waive that if we think that it's uh, worthwhile. And then items, these last items here, um, these are just the, you know, the, the, what we use to evaluate the grant applications. And these have been the same for a number of years and, and we're not really proposing to change those. And I think with that, that's, those are all the questions that we have. So I would welcome, you know, we went through this pretty quickly and all, and I, so I would welcome, you know, for you guys to think about this a little bit. And if you have, uh, if you just want to email me or, or mark up the document or whatever, um, you know, if you could send comments to, to Mary and Tanya, That'd be great, and we can try to incorporate all of the, the comments so that when this all goes to the commission, they have sort of all the information available to them. Okay. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Uh, seeing none, Joe, if you'll take that down, I think. Yep. There we go. Back to the uh agenda the next item we had on the agenda is the question of uh using use of the community mitigation fund for administrative purposes of the fund uh and before i hand it over to joe um we're also joined by our cfao derek lennon uh derek has uh, a very uh, lengthy career experience working in other state agencies uh so we invited him to also help us uh, have this conversation with all of you about using community mitigation funds for, uh, again, administration and staff resources, et cetera, to manage the fund. You know, I was uh, thinking today, 
uh, if you look back into the gaming statute, one of the uh, uh, one of the agencies that receives direct support uh, from a percentage of the gaming revenue taxes is the Mass Cultural Council, and the statute in assigning them money uh, specifically allowed them to use uh, I think it was up to fifteen percent. Uh, of the grant funds uh, to administer their own grant. So that's a question we certainly would like to, to hear from all of you, get your feedback on, but I will uh, I'll turn it over to Derek if he's still with us, if he wanted to join us and offer any comments or thoughts. There he is, Derek. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so if I start breaking up, just let me know, someone wave and I'll have to go off camera. My internet has been a little um, wonky today. So I'll just go off camera and that's kind of helped to allow me to uh, continue talking. But um, in the FY21 budget um, proposal that I brought forward to the commission, I had put in close to 200,000 in administrative costs for the community mitigation fund. And I was looking to charge off a piece of Joe Delaney and a piece of Mary Thurlow. Um, I have a lot of experience dealing with grant funding in the past at um, housing, and as, uh, housing and Economic Development. We worked on the Mass Works programs. Um, I was at Public Safety when the Office of Grants and Research was actually turned into the Programs Division and all the money for um, Homeland Security, federal money for that, the Byrne Grant, Violence Against Women, um, Juvenile Justice Programs, all consolidated under there. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's pretty consistent for administrative funds of uh, monitoring the grant or paid for by the grant. We haven't done that here just because casino revenues hadn't been coming in and we were working mainly off of the licensing fees. Now the casino revenues are coming in. We'd like to go through this process. Um, our legal department has recommended that we draft regs that allow up to a certain percentage of the um, community mitigation fund be allowed to um, be utilized for mainly protecting the grant funds because it is it is somewhat of a liability. You know, you've got a grant portfolio that's upwards of $10 million annually, um, and we have part-time Mary Thurlow and part-time Joe Delaney administering it. Um, we would love to do a lot more work on going out and reviewing some of the programs, making sure they're doing exactly as said. Um, not saying that in a bad way, but that's on the Comptroller's guidelines for efficient subrecipient monitoring. Um, right now we're doing it mainly through paperwork. Um, we're hoping that can alleviate some of the burden on the details that Mary's asking for through paperwork, um, the back and forth calls, uh, the back and forth emails, if we could just have someone dedicated to this. And that's part of uh, pulling Tanya over right now, but the gaming rev and the uh, gaming licensees are paying for all of this right now, um, once through the taxes that are um, being charged off, and then two through our annual assessment for everything that um, we pay for that isn't racing related. So a lot of this would be to make sure that dedicated resources are put towards this program. It's not someone's part-time responsibilities. Um, and then working, you know, one thing we're asking all of these groups to think about is, what's the right way about going forward with it, right? Um, it came up in one of, the, one of the regional meetings that just setting a percentage cap doesn't always make for efficient use of it. So would, would we want the commission to approve the annual budget um, is a question that came up in one of the, in the regional meetings. And I think that's a pretty good idea because it, it gets the same transparency as our budget process does um, to make sure that the costs are truly um, appropriate and it gives a public comment period for anyone that wants to say, I don't think that these costs should be borne by that program. Or um, if we're putting a, a certain, priority forward. I know that Joe and Mary would love to see a database. Um, being able to have a public process on that, what's the cost of the database versus just piecing off a percentage of it um, would make sense. Um, and 
you know, anything else that you could think of regarding how to make this program good because um, we want ultimately the best use of these resources. Um, we want ultimately the best use of this fund so that we don't have a negative audit ever come back and say, hey, look at this is what happened because that can destroy all the good work that's done with the program. Uh, so that's, that's mainly what we're proposing. Um, that's mainly the concept that we're looking at and we really look at the collaborative side. I know that um, Commissioner Stebbins has said he would love to see a equitable distribution between Region A and Region B on how much administrative funds are captured from each area of the grant program so that one region doesn't absorb all of the costs just because they don't give out as many grants each year. Um, you know, you figure out what the total cost is and then take that from Region A or Region B based on what their allocation to the um, grant funding is. So, you know, these are the types of things that we'd love to have hashed out. We can get those into regs so that they live. They're not just from year to year. Um, and then it takes a, a rather deliberative process to change any of those, those things going into the future. Thanks, Derek. Joe, anything you want to, anything you want to add? No, I think, I think um, Derek captured that pretty well. I think it's, you know, Going forward, as this program gets larger, and especially now that we're doing some construction projects, you know, we need to be out there in the field more, um, working with our communities and things like that. And that's certainly going to take more time um, to do that. And um, you know, and I think Derek mentioned the database and some other things. We definitely have some needs that, as this program gets larger, um, it becomes a little bit more unwieldy to manage. Okay. Um, as, as Derek mentioned, we are in the process, Todd, and the legal team of pulling some regs together. So as, as Derek pointed out, this would be kind of uh, ingrained in how we do business. And certainly all of you would be welcome to offer your comments um, and feedback in the regulatory process as well. But uh, open it up to see if anybody had any initial reaction or initial thoughts uh, with respect to Derek's comments. Uh, at this time. This is this is Sean. Hi Sean. Go ahead. I I I would just say that I think there's nothing wrong with doing that. You know, my local government experience, you know, always trying to charge overhead to certain funds and certain grants and those types of things. So that, you know, conceptually I don't think there's anything wrong with it at all. I just think that there does need to be a real formal and rigid approach to how you do it. I um, mean, you maintain consistently with consistency with that approach, but overall, I personally don't see anything wrong with that. Okay, thank you, Sean. Anybody else, Ron or Jennifer or Eric? I agree. I think I think it's a um, it's a good move. And especially if you want to provide the oversight that you've talked about, um, I think it's I think it's necessary. And Bruce, I'll just repeat what I said in the prior, meeting, which is it's it certainly is completely fair. It's logical, and as I mentioned, Derek, before I always like it done based upon sort of actual expenses to be reimbursed and not just some arbitrary percentage, right? So, agree that certain people at certain percentages and certain other expenses are. are paid for out of the fund, and I think that it would be hard for anybody to argue it's anything but prudent. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I agree as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I agree as well. It seems reasonable. It's consistent with how we treat our other federal state grants, um, as well as other local resources. Um, and just wanted to offer, I certainly would like to uh, be part of the regulatory review um, as being a Federal, uh, former federal auditor. Um, I, I dig this stuff. Um, so I'd be more than happy to uh, take a review and offer any comments as well. I'm making a note of that because we're going to take you up on that. Please do. Anybody else? Bruce, I, I think just what I want to mention, I think the intent was to send this out to all the members of the LCMACs and the the GPACs and you know the, the subcommittees and so on, just when the regs are out. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Um, 
Okay, we're moving through the agenda. I do need to go just back up to the top of the agenda uh, now that we have a quorum uh, again included in your meeting minute. Your meeting packet was the uh, minutes from the November 26, 2019 meeting. Uh, I'd love to have those approved if somebody would be willing to offer that motion. I'll make the motion that we approve those. Do I have a second? Second. Any comments, questions, edits, changes? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll have to abstain. Aye. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, uh, if I may, once again, uh, we need a roll call vote for things in this format. Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, all right. We'll quick, I'll quickly go across the top of the screen. Uh, Ron Hogan? Yes. Haskell Kennedy? Yes. Okay. Sean Cronin? Yes. Uh, John Robertson? John still with us? I think he's muted. Tanya, can you unmute? Hang on, John. We're going to unmute there we you. Go. There you are. Good. Thank you. I'm a yes. Okay. Uh, Eric? Yes. Okay. And Jennifer, I think you said you had to abstain. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Um, Jill, let's move on to uh, item number seven on the agenda, which is next steps. Okay. Um, so we're going to actually, Mary, can you um, can you give us a rundown of what the what the schedule looks like? I can. All right. So the next uh, subcommittee is on October 27th, 1.30 to 3. And then the next meeting after that will be November 23rd, again, 1.30 to 3 o'clock. And Mary, what are the topics that you have on for those meetings? Uh, the guideline discussion is one of them. So the draft guidelines on the October and then the yes. final in November? Yes. Okay. They have data breach. And so now what's happening is people are just, they're, they're just using this data to apply for unemployment insurance because, and hoping that they could set up the different email accounts and the like on it. Okay, so I think that's that's pretty much it. And they, okay. They just, it all just slipping through. It is. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I, I went on the website and um, so Tanya, like they don't have my can we just mute John? I think he's having another conversation. Okay. <laughs> there we go. All okay. right. Thanks, John. Sorry. Um, any other business? Anybody who have any, has anything they would like to raise with this committee at this point? Hmm. Nope. All right. Okay. Seeing none. All right. Um, if there's no other business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Second. Motion made by Ron, seconded by Haskell. I got to do another quick roll call. Ron? Yes. Haskell? Yes. Eric? Yes. Sean? Yes. Jennifer? All right, we'll go back to John and Tom. Uh, I'm a, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, yeah, everybody, yeah. for your time and participation. We greatly appreciate it. I uh, hope everybody stays well. It's nice to see everybody, even in a little box. But uh, uh, one of these days, we'll be uh, all back together. But thanks for your time and, and service on the committee. As the chair said earlier, she, uh, we all greatly appreciate it. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Take care, everyone. All right. Stay Thanks, safe. Everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.